Hello, women in product. My name is Yanchi Wilson, Senior Marketing Strategist here at Upwork. I'm joined here by an amazing panel of women in product within Upwork. And we'd like to come and talk to you a little bit about embracing rebellion to fuel product innovation. If you're not familiar with Upwork, here are a few things that you should know about us. We are the world's work marketplace. That we are focused on connecting millions of businesses with independent talent all across the globe. Upwork serves everyone from one person startups to 30% of the Fortune 100 with a highly focused platform that enables companies and freelancers to work together in new ways that unlock their potential. Our vision is independent talent at the heart of every single business. And our mission is to create economic opportunities so people have better lives. Now with this level of innovation and having a mission that's so strong, you have to be just a little bit rebellious, right? So our that's why our topic is all about embracing rebellion to fuel product innovation. In order to innovate, you have to go against the status quo and see the world as you want it to be. That means embracing a part of ourselves that is often in direct conflict with the sandbox we're assigned to play in and in order to create something impactful for the customer. In this candid conversation today with Upwork's product team, we're going to discuss how they navigate the new world of work post-COVID, methods that they've deployed to improve the product roadmap, and how going against the grade has allowed them to fuel innovation. I'm joined by Lindsay Silvestri, Hello. Item Mitten, Hi. and Linda Lowe. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? Great. Doing great. Excited yeah. to be here. <laughs> awesome. Well, Lindsay, let's start with you. Tell me, how did you get in a product, what you do at Upwork? And just a quick little icebreaker question so everyone can get to know you a little bit better. What did you want to be when you grew up? Yes. So hello, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lindsay Silvestri. I have actually worked in, in a customer success role my entire career. And due to Upwork being such a customer-centric company, the talent success team and community team, which is the team that I'm a part of, is actually part of the product organization. This creates an awesome opportunity to really streamline the process for our team to share all insights directly from our customers to help drive product improvement and changes. Um, as mentioned, I am part of the talent success and community team within the product organization. I'm a manager on the team. And my team, just to like highlight a little bit more of what we do, we support customers with one-on-one -on -one coaching, group events and workshops, community building, which allows us to help customers distinguish themselves in the marketplace and accelerate their business growth. Icebreaker question. Um, I feel like as a child, it always changes. But one thing that I was always passionate about was being a designer of some type, fashion designer, interior designer. Um, I love all things design. So um, something I can still focus on. But right now, I love being a part of the product organization at Upwork. And we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Lindsay. Item. Same questions for you. How did you get into product? What do you currently do at Upwork? And what did you want to be when you grew up? Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I started my career in financial services, so investment banking. Then I moved to private equity investing, but found my calling in product because it was this good mix of what I've done in the past, but I was what I was interested in, which was a lot about building businesses, solving customer problems, working with people from different functions. And I'm so um, I feel very lucky to have found that in product. Um, my first product role was a trip advisor. I was part of the founding team behind their experiences group. It was a really unique time of building a startup within a large company, growing that business. And after trip advisor, I joined an on-demand gig marketplace uh, focused on hourly work and led the product org there. So these two experiences combined the marketplace and kind of a startup within a big org, as well as the um, the talent marketplace business brought me to Upwork. And at Upwork, I own our project catalog business, which is a brand new way to use Upwork. Um, so project catalog allows our new clients to understand the breadth of talent on Upwork through predefined ready to purchase projects. And we actually just launched the product this year. It's in very early days and there's a lot of excitement around it. 
Um, my um, what I wanted to be when I was uh, when I was growing up, uh, similar to Lindsay, changed a lot. But I was very inspired by my first grade teacher. Uh, she was kind of a role model for me. So I would um, I always thought I want to be like her when I grew up. I would I remember coming home and you know putting my stuffed animals in a in order to give them homework. So I, I always thought I'd be uh, a teacher of some sort. Um, but yeah, product is is a better path. And I'm uh, lucky to have found it. Well, thank you so much, Ida. We're happy to have you here today. Thank and you. last but not least, <laughs> last but not least, Linda, um, please tell us how you got into product, what you do here at Upwork, and what did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah, yeah, great. So uh, the funny thing is that I actually had a, originally started my career in a schizophrenia lab at UC San Diego, uh, just really trying to understand, you know, uh, some of the, the brainwave activities and so on and so forth. And uh, when I realized that wasn't the right fit for me, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to join what was Odesk at that time as an intern. Um, and then really from there, I created what I like to call a mini rotational program, where I took on different roles across different functions at Upwork, uh, such as customer success, analytics, and marketing. And this is really what helped me build a strong foundation for when I officially started my product journey in 2017. Uh, and right now at Upwork, I currently lead our search and recommendations product. Uh, growing up, I think similarly with Lindsay and Ram, uh, definitely went through a lot of different uh, phases of my life in terms of what I wanna be. Uh, but I think what was the most um, kind of strong pull was I actually wanted to be a historian just because I just found uh, Different, different parts of history has such interesting aspects and even what's happening now and like how it's being captured and how it continues to be shared. I always found that to be really, really fascinating. Uh, but again, I just love interacting with people and solving problems. And so, which is why product is really where uh, I found my calling. That makes perfect sense. And it it's a perfect pivot to talk about our uh, subject here because history was made in this last year. I mean, the global pandemic that <laughs> shook the world and changed everything, right? We all had to adapt in new ways. So with this adaptation, product managers, um, you know, had to adapt to remote work, remote teams and everything. So with that in mind, um, Lindsay, I'd love to sh uh, kick it right over to you. Let's talk about the importance of collaboration with design, engineering, data, and just the other teams and how this alliance has evolved with the remote work environment. Yes, I'd love to talk about this a little bit more. Um, so as I mentioned in my introduction is, I'm part of the talent success and community team within Upwork. And we are under the product organization because that's what we do is we collaborate so closely with all these different places to really bring and express what our customers want um, and bring it to our teams to make sure that it's being implemented. Um, our team feeds customer insights that we get through activity on our posts that are in our Upwork community, conversations that we have with our customers in one-on-one -on -one coaching, and engagement in webinars, focus groups, and events. Um, taking this feedback that we get from our customers across the board and then really plugging into different areas within the organization. So data, product, engineering, and then really finding a way to um, drive what our customer wants and making those changes and improvements. Wow, yeah, it's, <laughs> I think that more than ever, teams have had to find really new ways to not only engage with each other, but really hear those insights for the customer. So, I mean, 100% spot on. Linda, same question to you. Yeah, so, so from my experience, the biggest breakdown with remote work and collaboration is the trust factor. Uh, so when Upwork shifted to a fully distributed workforce at the start of the pandemic, uh, I realized that I could no longer uh, rely on drive-by conversations or ad hoc happy hours to get to know people on a personal level. Um, and so when I first joined the team that I'm currently on, I, I made the mistake of taking that for granted, uh, which unfortunately eroded trust with uh, my, my partners like in data science, engineering, and design. Uh, so what I really learned is that it is important and it is okay to slow down and feel good about investing the time to build relationships 
especially in a time where you know we have less transparency into what's going on across the company because you're isolated in your own workspace and into what's going on in each other's lives offline. And so really taking the time to build a relationship and under each other's uh, understand each other's perspective is really, really important instead of uh, doing what I did, which is really trying to uh, drive value and improve that, you know, I have something to, to offer to this team and really focused on driving results, which isn't great uh, in terms of you know, having less opportunity to be able to have uh, more one on one connections with each other on the team. Yeah, and just to piggyback a little bit off of what Linda said, I actually was always working remote at Upwork, and I really felt like last year, yes, there is that shift of like, how do you make those connections? But I felt like overall, with all of our teams starting to re work remote last year, like Linda was saying, you know, being in the office, you had to change some of the ways you interacted with people. I really did feel like it helped our our, our employees understand what our customers are feeling as working remote um, and being part of Upwork. And it really has helped evolve and drive um, the, drive changes in our product that really meet the needs of our customers. So even though it was a year of like change, um, I do think that it really has brought to light um, and made us as a company become stronger. I think as women, um, we're in a very unique position as well, because very much like Linda was was talking about, we often are, are either trying to prove ourselves or trying to provide value. So um, being having this discussion that is catered specifically to women, I think there's this, there's this unique value that comes with this level of authenticity um, in this particular conversation. I certainly appreciate it. Um, Next question, uh, Lindsay, let's shoot this right over to you, starting with you here. Uh, again, with these new onslaught of problems that we encountered due to COVID, how did you and your team adapt your pro problem framing methodologies to address these new challenges? Yes, um, so as, as I've mentioned, as a community team, we are always working with the customer. Um, and our job is to listen to our customers and what their needs are. So some things that we did and I did personally um, was really reached out to our customers and schedule meetings with them to take the time to truly understand how were their businesses being impacted by COVID and what could we do to support these changes? Additionally, our community team really monitored what was the conversation that our customers were having? What were their needs? Where were their pain points? What could we do to help change that? Um, and just an example really quick, but without getting too into product, that we did do is we heard from our customers that there was a need for faster payments. We needed to cut the time that people were getting paid. This was a need that they were feeling. Um, so what our product team did is my team shared this with the team because um, we were seeing it across the board in the community as well as the conversations we were having and took it back to the product team and we were able to cut the payment time from five, 10 days down to five days. Um, and we just saw a very, um, just the community in general being so thankful for this that we listened to them, we were there to help them. Um, so I think the big thing was just like listening to what people needed and then finding a way to implement it. That is perfect. And, and it actually just feeds right into the question that's going to go right over to Linda about just the general user experience. Um, you know, it, it sounds like it, it was very, very, it sounds like there were quite a few things that were tied to this. And I'd love to understand what modifications were made to the overall user experience um, within the product for Upwork, and if you know any changes were made, how how did you improve and optimize it given the pandemic? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so similar to what Lindsay was already saying at the start of the pandemic, and and what we saw uh, was a lot of small businesses struggle as in person business was restricted, uh, and then on on the similar side of talent, we saw also saw a high volume of highly talented professionals either seeking work or wanting to offer their services to help. Uh, and so there was an obvious need to help our customers adapt in uncertain times, especially those that has not been with their businesses not being online. Uh, and so they had a lot of struggles and, and suffered from that aspect. And so uh, similarly with Lindsay, you know, we, we hear this loud and clear from our customers and from from the market as well. And so what we did was we assembled a small team to identify and curate top challenges that businesses were facing uh, to bring their businesses online uh, and as in-person business uh, kind of diminished and paused. 
And one of the things that we were able to do was, you know, it's scary to, to do something online, especially if you haven't done it before, and something like hiring and how do you even express what you need uh, given this time was that we created job templates based on these top challenges to really help these businesses uh, get the help they need quickly. And some of the key needs that we saw was around, you know, pivoting marketing strategies or even as simple as setting up remote work solutions uh, or moving their businesses online into e-commerce and, and getting financial uh, consulting because of what was going on. Uh, and then on the, on the talent side, I think Lindsay uh, articulated it really well was getting faster payments uh, and payouts were more critical than ever. Um, and then being able to help them receive their funds from five to 10 days was really, really incredible feat by the team. Wow, um, so much goes into <laughs> the the beautiful end product that that happens, and I'm sure every woman in product can really understand uh, the nuances of that. And with having to deal with your own realities, your personal realities, I'm sure that are going on around you as you work from home, but still needing to meet the customer need is a feat all by itself. So kudos to you guys. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're going to move on to the next portion of this as we talk a little bit more about product and innovation and, and just the future in general. Um, how we work was undergoing transformation long before COVID. In 2019, remote work was so widely adopted that experts predicted that the majority, that's roughly 56% of teams, would be remote workers by 2020. And that pretty much became a reality. It was like 100% of the world became remote workers due to COVID, right? So among the knowledge workers, the pandemic likely exceeded that estimate. So Item, I'd love to hear from you. How do you foresee this specific trend impacting how product teams develop and work in the future? Um, when I look at the changes in product teams, and um, in how we work this year and the ones really two big changes that I hope to have stick um, coming out of this. One is, of course, maybe the more obvious one, which is our ability to hire and retain top talent, regardless of geography. And then the second thing is, I think, redefining what inclusion means. And I'll start with that. Um, so these two values are critical pillars of innovation. And I think an innovative uh, product team ideas come from many sources and there's diversity of opinion but also inclusion of opinion um, how I think the the remoteness of the work facilitated that is it enabled inclusion of different communication methods it almost forced us right instead of Linda was talking about this you can't be um, really taking it for granted you're running into a colleague or sharing an idea in an in-person meeting we had to increase the different ways we communicate it. And what I believe that did for my teams is uh, the inclusion of diversity of personalities, work styles, and how people wanted to represent their voice in a, a collaborative setting. So for example, as we shifted our communication to Zoom calls or Slack, people from different levels of the organization, different functions or personality types found a voice, an opinion, bringing data and opinion to um, our workshops or brainstorming sessions that may have been harder to find in a large conference room. Um, and then as ideas become more visible too through written communication channels, I think we've seen asynchronous debates and discussions, whether an idea is seated on Slack, but you see it really grow over a thread and really grow into you know, an insight that teams collaborate around. Um, I think these became a lot more prominent um, through written communication, Google Docs, do document sharing, commenting. Um, I really hope that this sticks because it spurs better ideas um, and better collaboration. The second point, maybe the more obvious one, is not being bound to a geography when we're hiring, uh, when we're bringing in new voices. As a company, we, we um, a lot of our users are not living in the US, we have to represent their voice, uh, we're a global business. So we were able to bring together and we are able to bring together a global team that represents our global user base um, to the table through facilitating remoteness. And um, I think a lot of these ideas, and I hope a lot of these ideas are here to stay and they'll, they'll help us create better outcomes for the businesses we're part of. 
Thank you so much. That that highly insightful. Um, and I really think that very much like you said, this is the future of what we should see, not just within product teams, but in all teams moving forward. Linda, same question to you. Yeah, I, I mean, Iram articulated it beautifully. <laughs> so I don't know if I can do that even more justice, but I agree with her in terms of work flexibility and access to talent without geographical restrictions. That's really the benefit of remote work. And I've personally seen firsthand of the impact of building world-class products by bringing in that wide diversity of thought and ideas. And I, I love the point, especially made by Iram around different personalities and different working styles that really helps break down that barrier. I know there's like many, many books around like uh, how introverts can really uh, break into the world and, and within product and, and, and having to kind of be the center of a lot of different partnering teams. If you don't have that type of personality, historically, we haven't really seen, especially women in those areas, being able to stand out because you are kind of in a room, literally in a room of more dominant or louder voices. So that has been especially uh, kind of insightful to see us transition through. And, and I think for Upwork specifically, where you know our customers are really located all over the world. And so for me now, it's really hard to imagine our ability to solve these type of problems if the contributors are really only those that worked outside of our Bay Area offices, for example. Um, and so being able to see some of these uh, remote work aspects move into the mainstream, I really see product teams being able to tap into insights that's more directly resembling their target markets um, and to be able to work more intelligently uh, similar to what Iram was saying around uh, how we collaborate. And then there's also the aspect of productivity uh, where, you know, how incredible is it that while I'm sleeping in, in the, um, during the Pacific time zone, the design team in Europe is finalizing the prototype. And so when we do have our overlap between my morning and their evening, uh, we are already collaborating and moving on to the next stage. And so this concept of productive collaboration is on a whole new level once we can break down some of those barriers. That's wonderful. So this next question is going to be for each of you, and I'd, I'd love to definitely hear your response. I think you touched on it some earlier, but we can get a little bit more in depth here. The word innovation can be seen as an act of rebellion against conventional pathways. As the world's work marketplace, Upwork has a very intimate knowledge of using high-skilled on-demand talent to propel the projects forward. Talk about why using freelancers or on-demand talent is a necessity for product innovation. Lindsay, let's start with you. Okay, yes. So as Irem and Linda touched on earlier, um, some great points just about working with remote talent. Um, how I can emphasize on that is that my team, so I actually manage a team of success partner coaches that coach talent on really how to be successful on Upwork. And my team personally works with just very, very skilled talent. Um, talent across all different skills, um, including product, and we've seen just firsthand how agile and talented this talent is on Upwork. Um, we speak to them all the time and we talking about too about plugging into different teams and how they do this effectively. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, just the capabilities of being able to work with people all over the world and including people with different backgrounds and ideas. And what they can really do is just bring fresh perspectives and ideas to drive, you know, decisions an innovative product to bringing innovative product. Arden, same question to you. Um, so why why are freelancers necessary for product innovations? I'll highlight two reasons. So I think innovation by definition is something that doesn't exist, right? It's a solution in our case, to a user problem, it hasn't been solved before. And by virtue, the path to delivering it is not chartered. So I know for a lot of entrepreneurs, um, not just within our business, for product people, small or large businesses, it's impossible to be on that journey and plan every resource need from the start. So you learn and you discover what talent do I need? What expertise do I need to bring in? Being able to do that in the moment is and unparalleled strength. Um, and remote and on-demand talent is really the, uh, the best way to address this need. So imagine like how freeing it is for an entrepreneur 
they start working with and building relationships with subject matter experts without investing days or months into recruiting them. Um, so I think this is really powerful. And the second reason why I think on-demand uh, talent um, is necessary for innovation is because of the perspective they can bring to the table that, you know, how sometimes when we take a step back, oftentimes we can't. <laughs> um, it's, it's really uh, much easier to do that at the beginning of an engagement with, an, uh, with fresh eyes. And I've experienced this many times where we worked closely with um, a team of freelancers uh, who may be jumping into a project because their uh, help was so needed in the time. And they, they, the team was able to call out some of the technical challenges we were having from outside in. This could be rebellious, right? Calling out things without being afraid of disturbing the status quo because they had that they had that perspective. So we benefited a lot from you know catching our blind spots with this fresh perspective and really listen to their recommendations to improve our, whether it was culture or technology. So we felt this impact of their non-conforming rebellious opinion. That's extremely powerful. Linda, I'd love to hear from you. Great, uh, so so I touched upon this in my in my prior response. Uh, it's, it's really around, and then it is all about access to talent. Uh, so when I really think about it with on-demand talent, uh, like what Iran was saying, you can bring in highly specialized professionals to solve specific problems. And I think what's really powerful and that we don't really think about is being able to scale your workforce dynamically as needs change. And so, yeah, that's that's what I really think is the powerful stuff is that you as a PM, you're trying to figure out how to deliver value to customers at the right quality and the right time. And so when you th really think about that, sometimes you really just need to test out a concept uh, without wanting to, to invest too much time into actually building out uh, the, the specific areas in terms of technology to support that. And sometimes you just want to build and get a small group of people together to really um, execute or, or deliver the value in that sense. And so, you know, things like uh, Lindsay's team, a lot of what we partner on is, hey, we have this idea. We may not want to build it into the product just yet. And how do we leverage uh, these type of on-demand talent to really help us figure out, okay, what are some of the kinks that we need to work through? What are some hypotheses that we think that this is going to help deliver value before really diving deep into how do we change our product to really fulfill that? Um, and then on the other hand, what we really saw was, you know, half of Gen Z as a workforce have freelance in the past year. And what I see this as is really needing on-demand talent to cross-pollinate and bring in fresh ideas from all different sectors and competitors, instead of only, again, creating an echo chamber within your own company or within your own team. And that's really where I see on-demand talent really help uh, bring you the, the competitive edge over other teams or other, comp uh, other companies as well. I really like that kind of that cross pollination and and not focusing on that echo chamber that I mean, that would to me screams rebellion. <laughs> it's a very different way of thinking and operating to be able to get to the highest quality of, of product out there. So now we're going to go ahead and shift gears. We're at the last portion, uh, final portion here of our panel discussion. And we want to get a little bit more personal because this is a very unique audience. This is women in product. We have very unique problems <laughs> compared to our male counterparts. So as as the as the, this particular panel discussion is, is outlined, um, it's all about rebellion, right? Rebellion to fuel that product innovation. So with talking about that word, it can be very taboo and often misconstrued in a negative way. As women, we often have had to be rebellious to see change come to fruition. So for all the panelists, I, what I'd love for you to do is to talk about a time when you had to embrace your rebellious side to move the needle in a particular project. And um, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, so one example I'll bring here is a time when I, um, in, in order to get rebellious, really having to get comfortable with stepping outside of my comf the, the way I comfortable showing up as a leader. So uh, really rebelling against myself and the ways I'm comfortable with. So um, for example, um, there's a leadership style, um, a way I usually show up, manage and lead. And um, there were times, uh, especially through COVID, where I had to get very comfortable stepping outside of that and 
it was um, through a lot of the stresses that we were facing or our clients facing and or um, as our responsibilities grew, especially through last year. This is not um, a specific example of a project, but a client relationship I was closely involved in at my previous company. Um, they were really feeling the impact of COVID and really um, feeling the, the short-term urgency and not being able to focus on the long-term plans for their business, not prioritizing product adoption and change management accordingly. So my team was in a position where we had to influence the team with conviction in a very speedy manner from outside in. So uh, coming in with data, keeping them focused on their long-term goals because it was in their long-term interest. In this process, uh, there was a lot of not taking no for an answer um, because it was the best thing uh, to do for, for their long-term goals. But what it did for me personally was it called for a different way of leading than what I'm comfortable with, which is a lot through influence and relationship and credibility and uh, called me to be a lot more forceful and convict, uh, come with conviction into those conversations in order to favor speed. Um, and you know, there are many other examples of uh, in, in my leadership style, how change happens. And this is like uh, practicing a different move or using a different muscle. Uh, but at the end, I think um, it all uh, contributes towards the right goal, which is doing the right thing for our customers. I, I really do love how you talked about dealing with a rebellion kind of within yourself, like you having you realizing, OK, I am my own obstacle right now. How do I move beyond this to do what needs to be done? That being able to admit that and see that and overcome that is very powerful within itself. Linda, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I, I love that example, Iram. Um, so I think for, for my case, when I consider rebellion, I really see it as something as doing something that I believe I'm not fully qualified to do, uh, which is what I find to be something many women face at work. Uh, and so as an example, last year, I led a key company initiative where my key stakeholders were the SVPs of marketing and product at that time. And so my primary challenge then was really being caught between the differing directions that they each had. Uh, and then what resulted in was team churn because I wasn't able to provide a very clear direction because I, I wasn't receiving clear direction because I had two heads of uh, two large departments that have work, you know, having differing, uh, different opinions around where to go. Um, and so what was really nerve wracking, what I was, uh, what I felt to be really rebellious was I had to, sit both of them down and cl clearly articulate to my leaders that um, their indecisiveness was really hurting the team's motivation, motivation and velocity um, and propose what I believe to be the best path forward. Um, me being uh, uh, just a PM at that time, really going into this meeting was, was really scary, but uh, I, I think what really helped was being able to see like, hey, this is not helping the company nor the team nor myself in terms of uh, driving value. Um, and so uh, what ended up happening was the, you know, the company priority uh, pivoted around that time. And so I unfortunately moved off of that project. Um, but what that push really helped the, the team see that um, is really like, hey, we really need to have a really strong decision making framework in order to not have this happen again. And so we know exactly who's the actual approver and that should really only be that one person. Um, and who our kind of contributors are being informed in terms of uh, what to do moving forward. So that it's great because that act of rebellion helped produce change in processes to help them to be more efficient. So I, I love that. Lindsay, it's on you. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that, Linda. That was really inspirational. Um, as I was kind of thinking through this question um, of being rebellious, you know, instantly I was going to like, what's something big that I've done that's been rebellious. Um, but as I was thinking more and more, um, there was one small thing that I felt like that I did um, in my current role that really helped move the needle with our customers and made a better experience. Um, so as I mentioned, my team uh, works and coaches our customers directly to help them have a better experience. And previously, what, what my team was doing was reaching out uh, via a group setting and then expecting the response to come back via the group setting. 
I noticed that talent was not responding as much because they probably didn't feel comfortable. Like, who am I reaching back out to? Who am I talking to? Who is this? Why are they reaching out? Um, and decided to take a chance on what we were doing that was safe and we were tracking tickets. Everyone was seeing who was talking to who and creating more of a personal experience. Um, so instead of the coaches reaching out in a group setting, each individual coach was reaching out to our customer and really being there to help them. Um, so as Irene mentioned, at the end of the day, the goal is to create the best experience for our customers. Um, I brought this to my management. Um, they weren't sure because it wasn't as safe as what we were doing before and everything wasn't being tracked. But at the end of the day, it did create a better customer experience. We moved our needle from 2% response rate to an 18% response rate. Talent wanted to talk to us. They wanted to know that they had their own personal coach. And my team has done a great job managing it. And um, we're just seeing great great responses all around. So that's the one time that I really felt that I was rebellious, even though it was small, it made an impact because it moved the needle on what our customers wanted and needed. That is fantastic. Move, going against the status quo. I feel like anytime we go against the status quo, we try to make that change. Um, that that rebellious side kind of, kind of comes in, but it's oftentimes for the better because it's impactful and we leave a pathway for those that come after us. So we are at our very final question. And this is on very much the personal side because whether you know, you're a mother, a sister, an aunt, you have been impacted in one way or another. So, you know, working remote has definitely blurred the lines for each of us in the work and life balance. So, uh, Adam, I'd love to hear from you. How have you been able to navigate this and still be effective in both areas of your life? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So Linda uh, was actually talking about this earlier. So the need to understand what's going on in each other's lives because it looks different. Work-life balance looks very different for different people. So for our teams, we really need to understand and support people to do their best work while being able to show up for their personal commitments. For my case, uh, personally, I'm a parent and a caregiver to two toddlers. My partner, my husband also works. So this has continued to be a hard thing for our family and I know for a lot of other parents as well. So we lost even the small moment, moments of our commute or mental transition, spaces became more blurred. It made it hard to be present on both sides. Uh, and Zoom doesn't help for a lot of these uh, challenges. So some of the tactics that I use at home are similar to things that have worked for me uh, at work as well. So I try to start my day by setting intention. So it's often calm, uh, gratitude, being composed and being able to manage the stresses on both parts of my day uh, by reminding myself there's, especially through COVID, there's a lot going on that feels like it's happening to us. But at the end of the day, we can still control how we show up on both sides. Um, some of the other things I try to do is before going upstairs to my desk, um, try to sometimes walk around the block to create that mental separation that I used to have and enjoy or, and, or do the same thing before really, uh, before the end of day. Um, and I, I think finally the most important thing that has worked well for me is um, letting go of a lot of preconceived notions of how things should be and asking for help. Not just from our partners, which is often what we talk about, this uh, imbalance of uh, duties, chores at home, but from our teams. So one thing I've done that has really um, helped me is to publish this guide of working with me so my team members can have that glimpse of what is going on at home for me why am i not responsive between the hours of uh six to eight um but how i communicate what i expect um and i very much um ask them to do the same so that we are there for each other and enable uh it enables us to give us uh give each other the support that we need that's a that's a really helpful tip. I never thought about that to create a guide that it's like, hey, here's an instruction manual on how to deal with me. I got to do that for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, let's go ahead and let's close it out with you. Great. Uh, <laughs> I love that part about um, the husband, uh, Yunchi. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. I think 
echo everything that Ram just said. Um, I, I think one one interesting thing that you know I don't really hear get talked a lot about. I think there's definitely a lot of emphasis around uh, caregivers uh, and, and how that line has been blurred. Uh, and I think for me, I definitely found this challenging um, at the beginning when we moved to a full time remote model. Uh, but you know, as a as a long term commuter, and I think uh, in terms of you know, before I, I really had a very structured day just because I needed to commute to work and then commuted from work. And that took about three to four hours each day. Uh, and so and I didn't realize like how much of that is so structured in a way that maybe that type of strict boundary isn't healthy. And so as we moved to this remote model, uh, what I realized is I could get creative with how I want to divvy up my time during the day. Um, that's going to be more most productive for me. And I think this is what a lot of millennials and Gen Zers are really talking about around that schedule flexibility. Uh, so for example, uh, I can spend my early mornings getting caught up on emails and Slack before starting my back-to-back -back meetings, uh, and then really take the afternoon to walk my dog and also pick up my nephew from daycare so I can really help out my sister and my brother-in-law in terms of their caretaking workload. And then getting my after getting my workout in and, and eating dinner, then I can come back to do a few more hours of deep thinking work uh, because that's really where I function the best because I'm a night owl. And just being able to do that, whereas before, because I had to wake up at 6 a.m. Uh, to, to start my day in order to commute and so on and so forth, and even if I worked a little later um, at the office and having to commute back, being able to do all these things was pretty much impossible. And I, I wouldn't even be able to think about well, how do I actually structure my time in a way that's going to be most beneficial to me, which ultimately would benefit people around me because, you know, I'm, I'm healthier now that I can actually do all these things and also being more present uh, when, when I'm showing up for work because I'm not so drained from just doing that one to two hour commute into the office. I, I really do like that. And I think it's a great way to close all of this out is, uh, you know, as we've seen, rebellion in this sense allows us to be more present, to be more focused, to see the problems and things that are in front of us so that we can help impact the change that helps us to see the innovation that so many people are really, really after. So again, thank you, Lindsay, Linda, Iram. Thank you so much for spending time with me here today. And I hope each of you watching have gotten some value from this amazing group of women here at Upwork.